waiting to see what will happen, I guess. But, yeah, so I also have a ticket to Riot Fest in Chicago this September. So that's nice. three tickets that I – I mean, they haven't – I don't think they've really said what's happening with Riot Fest, mm-hmm. but I doubt it's going to happen. So I don't know if they'll just, if they'll do refunds or if they'll just say like, Hey, it's good till next year kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's like three tickets that I have in limbo right now. Oh. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who have a lot more than that yeah. um, as they were planning for summer festivals and summer tours and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's funny you mentioned monuments because I remember they, I heard about the visas, but they had just went through their second singer and they were playing with their newest one, if I'm not mistaken, when they were going to be coming to Ottawa. And I was looking yeah. at, looking at getting those tickets. And, um, actually I had no idea that you, you were into monuments and for anybody who might know this band, um, I personally really enjoyed, um, I, I'm drawing a blank, the second lead singer, Huge hair. Chris Barreto. Chris, yes. He was insane. He was insane. I remember watching, like, the Wacken shows, uh, the live at Wacken, and he his energy was insane. And then when he was no longer part of the band, I thought, okay, well, these are pretty massive uh, shoes to fill because we've all seen what happens when somebody steps into such a pivotal, like, a very... Uh, influential and hard to replace type of artist where the band just isn't the same. Um, how do you feel about the new, the newest singer? Uh, I haven't honestly taken, like, I just, I really love the songs. Um, Amanuensis is like a really, really good album. Um, and so at, while, um, while acknowledging, like I knew that it wasn't going to be, you know, Chris on the tour, yeah. uh, I did a little bit of reading and people didn't seem like to be saying too much about it. So I, uh, honestly, it's just, it's kind of a, the rest of the band still the same for me. So yeah. I was really still pretty stoked, like, to be honest, but, but at the same time, you know, a little disappointed because I do really like his vocals. Um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, he's just, yeah, but really killer band. And I'm hoping that <laughs> one day I will be able to, to see them in Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's interesting because I feel like, there was just so much that was going and the, the irony of this whole thing is that it seemed like there was more and more bands that were coming through the Bronson center was going to be just pumping out acts and then yeah. all this happened. So I hope that this is just giving more time to get, you know, more solid acts and everything like that. And it's funny because, um, we, the last time I think we bumped into each other would have been, was it the, the bear tooth show? Were you at the, the Bear 2 show? Uh, the, the one at the Bronson Center with, yeah. uh, with Hands Like Houses? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I think we saw each other there. Yeah, so this is, it's interesting because that, that show in particular, um, sorry, in particular, that was supposed to have Of Mice and Men. And yeah. that was, it was going to be insane. It was going to be a crazy show. And I remember that the tickets that I had, they were like, okay, well, since you've bought, uh, you heard her purchase your tickets, you're now going to move to this special section. And it was, it was crazy because it's like, in reality, I just wanted to get into the pit, but there was all these whatever. It was amazing to see that that many people rocked out and still, you know, had an amazing time at that show, even without of Mice and Men. And I know that sometimes, you know, when bands they're on a bill, they, they come off, people still go. I was honestly expecting a bigger impact than that, all things considered. But now, Beartooth, I've, at least from that point of that show, they're doing insane tours. They're doing almost stadium shows sometimes. So I think that uh, it's amazing when people will come and just support the hell out of a band, even when uh, you know things might not go according to plan. Uh, what did you think of that show in particular? Uh, I, I remember it being hot as hell. Yeah. Um, it was like, I'm glad that they put some upgrades into the Bronson Center. Um, like since that show, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard that it's, it's quite excellent. Yeah. But that was, yeah, there were so many people in that pit who were going so hard. Like personally, I was there for Hanslick Houses and Beartooth because, uh, the, 
those are two like i never really got into of my cement but bear tooth uh especially the first album and the third album as well uh amazing amazing albums and i was not let down at all with their performance like i saw them at heavy montreal in i think 2015 and um like i've heard that they like especially caleb on the vocals could be hit and miss uh i know he's got some health problems or something but this show they absolutely killed it and seeing them play like a real like a nice extended set and everything and all of my favorite songs uh yeah that was one of the more memorable shows that that I've seen in Ottawa in the last little while. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, I didn't really know Hands Like Houses that well. I knew like two songs and they were amazing. And one thing with uh, these, these bills is like, you know, yeah, it was Beartooth and Of Mice and Men that were headlining, but I became a Like Pacific fan literally right after that show. Like they were, they were amazing, amazing. Like for that style of music, I, I really enjoyed what they were doing. And, you know, it just kind of goes to show that, you know, you go to a show and you might not know the bands on the bill. And then literally you go down this rabbit hole of just discovering, oh, well, they opened for these guys before and then they played for them. And it's just this huge, like plethora of musical goodness, literally just by going to see a show and seeing the openers. You know. Yeah, and I mean, festivals are excellent for that, too. Like, going and just, like, all right, we have a break. Do you want to go walk around, maybe get some food and, like, pass by all the stages and see who else is playing? Yeah. Um, even just reading down the, the poster at all of the bands that are playing, uh, you can, like, discover some new stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not going to make this easy on you. Um, one, right. one of the things that uh, I always like to see um, is uh, whether or not people could take three of their favorite bands. And I, I don't expect you to na- be able to nail down three of your favorite bands, but if you could okay. pick three bands that you just could not live without, what would they be? Um, so Kogi and Cambria is like almost always my number one. Nice. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, been my favorite band for a very very long time um rise against has always been pretty high up there yeah uh like in high school they were my favorite band um probably what got what like what really got me into like sort of punk and post hardcore Mm -hmm. and then other than that uh it's yeah that's where it gets like really i know i know (laughs) Um, I do listen to an awful lot of God is an Astronaut, so like I could re-listen to those albums probably an unlimited number of times. Um, they just have, like they've got a really, like quite a big catalog, Mm -hmm. but also just with instrumental music, I find it's really hard to get bored of it because, I don't know, it's just like you don't, you don't have like the same lyrics like drilled, like hammered into your head over and over again. So as much as, but I still get their stuff, like their music stuck in my head all the time. It's kind of the fact that there's no lyrics. So I'll just have a melody stuck in my head. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's a God is an astronaut song. So it's still catchy, Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So they don't sacrifice catchiness and hooks just because they don't have lyrics. So Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that probably really keeps me coming back. And I showed them, I have a friend who teaches yoga and she, now plays God as an astronaut during her yoga classes nice. and stuff. Um, it's it's really good, like, chill-out music um, for just, you know, putting on, whether it's to, like, read or study or to go to bed or just even to, like, meditate or veg out. Like, yeah, I uh, it's probably one of the bands that I listen to the most often. So nice. they probably, and they've never... There's not a single piece of their music that I don't like. Yeah. So, nice. yeah, that, yeah, that's okay. So yeah, we'll settle it at Kogan Cabrera Rise Against and God is an Astronaut. <laughs> okay, so the hard part, you'd have to open for one of them, you would close for one of them, and then you would have to cut the other one off the bill. Yeah, that is tough. <laughs> um, so. 
And I'm asking this because I can't do it. I can't. I couldn't name three bands I like and then have to do that. Yeah, no. So I, I think just the promoter in me would be like, okay, sorry, you got us an astronaut, but you don't really fit the bill. We're gonna do um, like Rise Against, T Rex Marathon, COVID in Cambria, and then yeah. yeah, I feel like that would be, you know, I mean, obviously. It's, it would be extremely hard to follow or open for any of those acts. Yeah. So, like, when I say, like, T-Rex Marathon Sandwich between, you know, my two favorite bands, like, yeah. that's pretty – But it feels like a really, like, kind of ballsy statement, but that's just that's just the game. I'm just playing the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because, uh, like I said, I, I couldn't do it. I spent a long time trying to just figure out three bands that I could even say that would be – you know, my three favorite, because it's funny because people will ask you, it's like, oh, what's your favorite movie? It's like, I can't answer that because there's just, there's so many. It's like, what's your favorite band? And if you can name a band that's in your top five, then I commend you because there's just, just a plethora <laughs> of music. And it's interesting because I also think about that if I had to choose between, well, actually the three that you picked, um, I've seen Coheed. And I'm sure you have as well. Yeah. That I seen them in the middle of the day, in the middle of the afternoon, and they were just destroying. Like it was 11 p.m. closing out. Where did you see them? Blues Fest. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I saw them at Riot Fest um, in Toronto in 2015, and I think it was right around sunset, and it was. Uh, yeah, it was like it was the first time I'd ever seen them too, and it was one of the best performances I've ever watched. Like, they they are excellent performers mm -hmm. and and f like flawless musicians. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Riot Fest Toronto. A lot of people forget about Riot Fest Toronto. That was an insane festival. It's really too bad because it was yeah. a division of, of the Chicago. And um, I forget the uh, the other one. What's Denver, it? it was Denver. the other one. So they don't do it in Denver anymore either. It's only wow. in Chicago. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I went in 2015, the last year they had it in Toronto. And it was a lot of fun. And then when we saw the lineup for last year in Chicago, we just decided we're going. Yeah. So we, we made the trip down. Um, like we left... We left on the Thursday, drove 12 hours down, Jeez. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then on the Monday, we drove 12 hours back. Wow. Now, yeah. I, I think that we might have been at the same Riot Fest. Was that the year with The Cure? Uh, no. Um, who was at 2015 Riot Fest? I remember seeing Monin, um, Guar, Alexis on Fire, uh... Weezer headlined both days. Oh, okay. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. They played Pinkerton on one day and the Blue Album on the other day. Nice. Uh, yeah, it was super good. I saw Bleachers. I saw Frank Turner. Um, Cancer Bats were there. They also did a Bat Sabbath set, which was really cool. And, yeah, obviously Coheed. Um, I think Rancid might have been there performing an album. Because that's another thing, too, at Riot Fest. They always have them do album performances. So, like, at Riot Fest last September, uh, Blink-182 did... Um, I can't remember which album. They did it front to back, though. Um, uh, who else? <sighs> trying to remember. Oh, Take It Back Sunday did my two favorite albums front to back. Nice. That's another band that's just like has been grinding for so long. They they've been playing for so 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 long, and they're they, yeah. they're consistent. And if I'm not mistaken, they still have all original members. Uh, no, they don't anymore oh. because Eddie Reyes uh, left the band. Um, he was the only original like founding member, mm -hmm. so. The lineup that they had at the first album wasn't all of their founding members, per se. Uh, like, Jesse Lacey, the singer of Brand New, mm -hmm. used to be the bass player in Take It Back Sunday, but he left before the first album came out. Um, so, 
Yeah, so they, they have swapped out at least one guitarist, and Eddie Reyes now plays in a band called Fate's Got a Driver. Um, TRX Marathon got a chance to open it for them in Quebec City on our tour. That was really, really wow. cool. Like, meeting, meeting Eddie Reyes and chatting with him and just, like, yeah, because, I mean, Take It Back Sunday is a huge band for me, too, yeah. um, especially influencing the way that I play uh, on, like, T-Rex's more kind of pop-punk songs and stuff. Um, and, yeah, uh, and uh, I also went to their show on the same tour on the Monday with my roommate Liam um, back to Cuff that uh, Christina was hosting, mm-hmm. and... Yeah, it was, yeah, they're just honestly a super incredible band and really, really nice guys. And like Eddie Reyes is one of the most chill, down to earth people I've ever met. Um, I mean, I feel like his life journey was kind of, kind of humbling and also being back, you know, going from Take It Back Sunday, uh, playing Ride Fest and Blues Fest, and then being in a band who's, you know, playing on Monday night at the cuff. Yeah. Um, that's definitely kind of like humbling and sobering, but he honestly is one of the most positive people like that I think I've ever met in that, like from that background and that situation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was really, yeah, he's a really inspiring dude and super chill, super nice. Nice. It's interesting because you can become, you know, and I'd love for you to weigh in on this. It, it's both, like we'll say, in movies and um, musicians. Um, we have this idea of what people are like. And it's like, oh, well, we, we sometimes make them out to gods. And I will reference even uh, Hatfield he, or even um, uh, Mustaine. Uh, he once said, he's like, you know, people, well, like when he got sick and he was like, well, no, you can't get sick. Like you, you're... Dave Mustaine, like, you just don't get sick. You need to perform. You need to continue. And so we have these ideas of musicians even before we know them. It could be sports players, actors, whatever. And then we meet them, and it literally can go one of two ways. I don't know anybody that's just like, oh, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. It's like, oh, it was it was even nicer. She was even more amazing. Or they're like, he was an absolute dick. And yeah. it's so comforting when you meet these people that, you know, you're a fan of their music and literally who they are is just a direct translation to and from their music. So it's, it's really great when you, you come across that. And, um, I guess one of the examples of, uh, not being necessarily positive, um, would be, uh, what's his name? Craig, uh, Danny, Danny Craig. Uh, yeah. Um, he, yeah, I, you know what? Oh, Johnny Craig. Yeah, Johnny yeah. Craig. Dance, Johnny Craig. Dance, X Dance. Yes. So I, um, yeah, I love Dance, Kevin Dance. I honestly think that their most recent album was an absolute, like, banger front to back. So good. Uh, they just keep getting better with everyone, really. Yep. Their current lineup is definitely their strongest and their best. And I have read and watched so much stuff about Johnny Craig, and I'm just like, I can't believe, like, I, ne- I never liked him as, you know, a lot of people he's that like original singer yeah. he's kind of he's a little bit behind the sound of like dance gavin dance and stuff yeah. but i never really liked him in, like i didn't get into dance gavin dance until tillian was already the vocalist yeah. um but i never like looking back on the old catalog stuff i mean i don't like kurt either yeah. i like johnny craig as a singer marginally more yeah. but as a person it's just like yeah when you read some of the stuff <laughs> and you look at some of the things that some of these people do and like try to get away with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, then like all of the, the cancel culture stuff comes in. Right. So like there's musicians that I've liked that have been revealed to do super like, Oh yeah. Questionable or even illegal things. And then that the whole band gets taken down when one guy does that. Right. Except sometimes that's not what happens. And then you get some guy like Johnny Craig, who is not really doing, I mean, some of the stuff that he's been accused of doing or that he's been revealed to have done is, you know, questionably illegal or things. But then to see him, you know, not really face a lot of consequences 
And from what I can tell yeah. that, you know, he basically, and, and well, cause the thing is like, you make a mistake and you learn from a mistake. Yeah. I definitely believe, I think that cancel culture can be really, really aggressive sometimes and that people, people can change and people do deserve chances at redemption and people do make mistakes but a person who consistently makes mistakes and never makes an effort to get better and never changes uh yeah it's sometimes it's just really aggravating to see them continue to do what they're doing um in in the music scene or in their daily lives Mm -hmm. or just you know with whatever they're doing it's interesting because um even his side projects um slaves like it's not bad it's not bad music but what seems to happen with him in particular is like you know starts a band it turns out to be okay and then dance gavin dance went on to be so much greater without him but then another band has started slaves out of that band tried to go on didn't work out problem is when you do that like again again dance gavin dance is a very it, it's a and it's an exception because the other bands didn't get to come out of that and then you have these these members who are just associated with oh you you know you're not as good as the previous singer you're not as good as the previous guitarist or bassist or whatever it was and i remember that used to happen so much uh you know mid 2000s where a lot of like you know oh my goodness who would it be like oh my goodness it, pretty much everybody in the warp tour like it would be like you know somebody would somebody would pop out and then somebody would take over the you know the lead role or as the guitarist and it was like oh well you were the former member of this or the former member of that you're not as good as that and good as this i, I think it is to the original lineup by only like yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and the thing is i think that we just need to get away from everything being a competition and and being a, yeah. compa- a comparison and especially sometimes though like you do have to you do have to keep up producing something that people do want right yes. like um i think about uh what's like sometimes the band just kind of like it, it can just lose the soul of what it is like three yeah. days grace without adam gontier is like not that i think three days grace is exactly like, right so it's like okay like yeah. good job trying but unfortunately or like uh, escape the fate without um, Ronnie Radke. Yeah. Like it's not that Ronnie Radke's done anything good since getting out of jail, because mm-hmm. that's why he left Escape the Fate. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just yeah, it sucks. Like this band falls apart, and then neither resulting kind of like parties. Yeah. The guys, the guy's new solo project and the band that replaced him both end up kind of not being as good as the sum of their parts. Mm -hmm. Um, but some bands, um, absolutely kill it. Like at rock fest, I saw stone temple pilots and they put on a killer show. It was so good. They were one of the best bands there. And those guys aren't young anymore. Um, and of course, Scott Weiland's dead. So they've got, the new singer, I can't remember what his name is, but he absolutely killed it. And it was one of the most memorable performances of that festival, which was, yeah, which is like really saying something because they, they have had some pretty strong, uh, performers, you know, play. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because when you have such a, uh, well, it's great to see when the people who take over pay homage to the previous, singer but then still kind of give their their own flair to it and i think uh one of the i was so worried that uh allison chains wouldn't come out you know guns blazing again but they found the perfect match somebody complimented you know the the previous sound and um it's great It's, it's really great and uh you know there are times where you just can't fill those shoes and oh you might not necessarily be a fan of it but even uh journey um, I, the gentleman, I think Arnel Pina, I, I can't I remember his last name, but you know, he came back and look, they took off and they're still touring the world. So like to your point, yeah. there are people who can step in and, uh, carry such a heavy, heavy weight to be able to have like a monster of a name, you know? Yeah. And then, 
And then the bands like Dance Gavin Dance, who just cycle so many members um, and yet manage to persist and like become like an institution, right? Yeah. Uh, where I, I'm trying to think of, of other bands that have like gone through similar things where, you know, they flip singers a few times or whatnot. But uh, like Dance Gavin Dance is a really great example of. Oh, the other one I was thinking of is Tesseract. Tesseract has switched singers a few times. Yes. And they're back to the original lineup, um, kind of like Kill Switch Engage did, uh, mm-hmm. with, you know, How the vocalist is... coming back into yep. the band. Um, and yeah, so you do get some of those bands that, like, well, and what I found was really interesting for Kill Switch Engage was after Jesse left and Howard came in, Howard really had his own sound mm-hmm. and he did something really amazing. And then when Jesse came back to the band, he had to fill Howard's shoes, yeah. even though it was his band first. Yeah. Um, and that was something that I think it took him a while to get into because uh, I watched some live videos and I was like, he can't do what Howard could do. But then I saw him at Heavy Montreal um, the same year that I saw Beartooth and he absolutely killed it and then i saw them again at rock fest and yeah like he's really come into his own uh in that band and he's able to perform all of the songs that him or howard wrote yeah. like flawlessly there uh i saw them at uh at rock fest um as well and their performance amazing absolutely amazing and it's interesting and there's not too many bands that I can think of to kind of what you were saying that were original had somebody come in and I'll say almost better than the original and carry that band for two three albums and then the original come back and have to literally outperform the person who was filling in for you if you want to look at that way and then be able to continue and I remember just the ha- the Kill Switch Howard days. It was something. It was like a wrecking ball. It was just insane shit that they were that they were writing and everything. And you know, then there was writing differences and things like that. And then it's nice to see that Jesse could come back and still uh, play with that band and them still be juggernauts because their last two albums were insane. Like there was like yeah. I could listen to it front to back. Yeah, they still keep churning out like amazing albums. Um, and again, for a band that's been around for uh, what, since like 1999 or 98 or something, yep. and still be putting out like quality albums is, I mean, that's a feat in itself, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, my man. So, well, I gotta say, nice shirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did on purpose, not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So, what do you got? Uh, what do you got for the good people? What do you want us to uh, to check out? Uh, new music links. What What do you want us to hear? So, um, there's there's stuff like still in the works coming up. Um, obviously, like I was saying, like with in terms of release dates, it, it's kind of hard right now. But uh, people could probably expect a new Flydance music video and single uh, in the next. I want to say month or so, we should be able to, to get some sort of fresh stuff to the people. Nice. Um, stuff that's, yeah, a song that's never been recorded. It's been, it's been heard live before, but never recorded, um, not in any of the live sessions. But if people do want to hear some of the new music that's not on, because there's the first EP on Bandcamp, and then we have live sessions of three songs from the upcoming album. We're going to have a music video or two coming up soon. Um, the album is very close to done, so just keep an eye out for that. Uh, it'll it'll be coming, mm-hmm. and then T Rex is also working on wrapping up an album again, really scheduled to be determined. But that's going to be coming up, and it should be. I mean, I, that's the thing with this whole COVID yeah. thing is like yeah. we're we're hoping for this year, yeah. but again, it's kind of just gonna depend on on how how the industry kind of goes what's what seems to be the right the right plan and stuff Mm -hmm. but uh yeah so there is we've got two full-length albums there that are recorded and nearing the end of the mixing and mastering um 
process. So hopefully be able to get those out to people soon. So definitely something to keep an eye out for. Uh, I, th- depending on how, you know, writing and stuff goes for, for these new side projects, there might be stuff to listen to maybe demos in the near future. We do have, uh, un- like a certain ability to, to do some rough recording and stuff here. I'll actually, I'll turn this camera around yeah, and just give you a see quick it. look at, this is the room that I'm sitting in right oh, now. Oh, Jesus. So, yeah. Wow. We've got three drum kits um, and a lot of vintage amps and other gear, guitars, lots and lots of pedals all over the floor. That's just kind of, yeah, me and my roommate are... <laughs> We're wow. both really into like guitar and pedals and stuff, and yeah, it's uh, part of part of like part of the quarantine thing. Also, is yeah. like trying to get to sell and buy gear because um, like Long Look was doing curbside stuff, yeah. and but Kijiji was like it's it's surprising how how much people are willing to accept e transfer instead of cash only <laughs> when. Uh, you can like spread disease on on twenty dollar bills. Yeah. So, yeah. No, Kachichi really used to be like, yeah, no, cash only. Uh, I don't do e transfer, and now it's like everyone's like e transfer. I'm not touching your cash. Yeah. So, yeah, managed to pick up a, like sell a few items and pick up a, a few new pieces of gear like nice. during this quarantine thing without you know you know obviously while taking the, the necessary precautions and stuff. But yeah. but yeah, we've got we've got some stuff here to, to make some magic happen. So hopefully we're gonna be able to you know, we're gonna have enough written that I I'd like to be able to start bringing some of that to the to the world soon. But mm-hmm. again, yeah, it's uh it's really uncertain times and it kinda yeah. kinda puts a damper on things a little bit, but try to keep our, our heads up and, and keep chipping away at it, you know? Are you guys uh, able to get some of the recording done out of there, or are you recording, planning to record someplace else? So we'll probably, just because uh, recording can be such a useful tool in the songwriting process, mm-hmm. um, like getting demos done, and you know, you you throw a drum beat down, and then you end up writing guitar over top, but then while you're writing the guitar, you get a new idea for the drum, so you go back and change it, and then by the end, you have this template and all you're doing when you go to the studio is you're going to the studio and you're re-recording it with better quality. Mm-hmm. So then you also minimize your studio time um, because studio time can rack up real quick. Yep. So yeah, that whole pre-production process after the experience uh, I've had with my bands in studios, um, it's a real like it will save me a lot of a lot of headaches, a lot of money, and it's, it's really fun. Again, if you have the resources to be able to do that, mm-hmm. we used to, like T-Rex used to have, now we have the resources here now that I, I li- I've only lived here since September. But before that, we were we were outsourcing to like a friend who would just kind of help us get a rough demo done so that if you have something to show to producers, like this is what we're trying yeah. to, to, to get done kind of thing. But yeah, especially when you're only two people, like right now, um, I think the drum, like the drums that I would want to write for our like post rock black metal project, would probably be beyond my ability to play. So until we have the ability to, like, we could program the drums, but until we have the ability to get someone in here who's skilled enough to play the parts as you know we kind of want them, then we're limited at how much we can write or how much we can actually record at high quality. Mm-hmm. Well, when it comes to stuff like, like the uh, the more indie folk kind of things, you know, both of us play bass, both of us play guitar. I play drums. Um, we've got some some synth ability and some like drum pads and things sitting around. So definitely enough to probably even just like make a fully fledged uh, rough is like rough demo going maybe. If we were able, because drums are the hardest thing in my opinion, so if we're able to get a satisfying drum sound, we could get a full recording gun in here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is definitely as as something of an audiophile. I do like having 
a really, really like well, well produced sound. Yeah. And as someone who also doesn't know a lot about like too, too much about recording, um, sometimes uh, like I might lack the confidence to be able to get the product to a level I want with my own knowledge, skill and experience. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. And I mean, supporting local businesses too is, yeah. is great. And there's a lot of producers in the city that I've really loved to work with and bring a repeat business back to them is, uh, is really, well, it's, it's just easy with the experiences that I've had, you know, um, you, you brought up an interesting, uh, subject tracking or not tracking. Because some people are, are fine with going in and just, you know, programming the, the, the drums in and some people just will not do it or, or you know, it's like one of those I'm purist thing and I, I get it and uh, obviously being a drummer, I won't ever program the drums, but uh, I know that there's some people in situations where it's like, you know what, if I wasn't able to program the drums, I would have never gotten this project off the ground. Yeah, so especially if you're a one-man project, uh, then it's a no-brainer, right? Mm -hmm. But I've also had, like, listened to albums where the drums are 100% programmed and they sound awesome. And the drum, like, and then, like, I asked, the, I remember this one band, they were from Windsor, they're called Faithful Unto Death, and I, I T-Rex Marathon opened for them once, and then I bought the two albums that they had there, and we were talking. They were like, "Yeah, all the drums are programmed," and just like turning to the drummer and be like, "Oh, that must sting, eh?" He's like, "I can play all the parts, so like, why would it? <laughs> you know?" Yeah. So, but then some drummers like uh, like Travis Parker from Blink One A Two, who enjoys also programming drums and having hip hop beats in the music, yeah. and uh, yeah. So, and then there's also people especially in the interest of achieving a certain sound, like adding samples or layering samples, you know, like a really, really good kick drum sound is achieved most of the time by recording the kick drum and then layering a sample on top of it and, and getting it at a certain mix. Um, or like metal drummers who use triggers, right? Yeah. Like that's not, that's a, that's a program sample. Mm -hmm. It's not what the drum actually sounds like. So then, yeah, people using these kind of hybrid setups or people using drum pads and live looping stuff. Yep. Like, you know, they're still playing it. It just doesn't sound like a drum. Well, mm. like, a, like an acoustic drum, but it's still, you know, it, it still requires skill and stuff. So yes. I, uh, and honestly, programming drums can be a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible than owning an entire drum kit, mm -hmm. recording it well, and like spending studio time or whatever. Um, so yeah, I've never really had, I remember obviously like as a, as a teenager or like even in my early twenties, like thinking like, oh yeah, I know real instruments are way better. And you know, like pop music is garbage and you know, metal and punk all the way. Yeah. But I feel like, yeah, as I've, as I've, seeing more and more bands play live but also just been exposed to more music and been a little more open-minded like music is music and whether you programmed it with like a computer or you or you played every single instrument yourself like it's as long as it appeals to me and like the art and is is good then yeah i'm fine like yeah. Some people have done really, really good jobs putting together sample packs that sound like realistic drums, and I've listened to albums that are entirely, entirely programmed drums, and that I, I, I loved. So yeah, it's just I, I think that part of the thing is, is that for me at least, is it, I just don't want the music to lose its soul. So if you, you're going to program, sure, but there still has to be some type of substance, some type of soul where yeah. it's like you created this and it's no, and it's, it's not just a machine. It's not mechanical to the point where it's like, okay, we programmed every bit of this. You're going to come in, you're going to sing on it. Here's our, our, our robot 
whatever. And I know I'm being very, very um, over exaggerative about that particular yeah. s- statement, but it, it it's it's kind of true. And I find that, like for instance, uh, one of my all time favorite bands, at uh, least metal bands, is Gojira, and um, Mario Duplante. His drumming, he literally has soul while playing metal music. And I find that if you go to the extent where it's just, oh, I forget what band it was, but um, they literally just programmed the double kicks. So it was just machine gun kicks for like yeah. this death metal thing, whatever. And then, yeah, sure, he, he played some cymbals and things like that. But like, I I lost my investment as a music fan when I realized that you you didn't put yourself into it. I'm not going to put myself into it. And I know that might yeah. seem so, you know, whatever, sappy, whatever it is. But I, I for me personally, that that's kind of my stance on it. Well, and again, like, there's some genres that do use, like, predominantly, like, triggered double bass that I honestly, I don't really listen to um, just because... It isn't really my thing, but like I can I can respect that at certain speeds you can't uh, apply enough pressure to make a sound loud enough mm-hmm. to like some of these guys are going so fast with their feet yeah. that if it wasn't triggered it wouldn't you wouldn't hear it because it's not the actual contact with the skin just isn't loud enough. Yep. But like I also know uh, well. At the end of the day, the way I always see, like, whatever instrument I'm playing, because, like, I do play drums in a band with Liam as well, uh, that we're, we were also hoping to get music recorded before this whole COVID thing happened. But, um, so I play drums, and I I like playing the parts, you know? Like, yeah. if I were to program them, it would be out of a simplicity thing for demoing, but I would want to record them for... I would want to have them like like acoustically recorded for an album, mm-hmm. uh, and but when it really like at the end of the day, the approach that I take when writing any instrument is like it has to serve the song. So if you have electronic drums and it serves the song, mm-hmm. sweet. If you have acoustic songs and uh, acoustic drums and it serves the song, awesome. If you have acoustic drums and it does not serve the song, and it would have been better off acoustic or electric rather then that's where like i find it's gonna yeah like kind of lose lose me a little bit because it's like why did you make that choice when it clearly um undermines undermines the song but as long as it supports the song and stuff but again most of the music that i listen to has acoustic or acoustic sounding drums and play and they play with a drummer live who can play all the parts so, yeah, as much as I support people creating art whichever way they want, I definitely tend to fall on the, like, on the side of, I like to play in bands with drummers, I mm-hmm. like to drum, I like to hear recorded drums, mm-hmm. because, yeah, there is, like, there's dynamics that you lose a lot of time if you're using samples, like, yeah. Um, with with electric kit, like a lot of time, there's an intensity yep. kind of yeah. You, you can you can trigger different sounds depending. So you can still have dynamics and stuff, mm-hmm. but when it comes to like death metal with triggers, they, there's there is none. Yep. So when you lose that dynamics, hopefully you are sacrificing that, or either the sacrifice isn't noticed, or you're sacrificing it for a better gain somewhere else. Yeah, because <laughs> in, in like in like hip hop and stuff, I can't imagine having super dynamic drums because that would take away from everything else that is happening, mm-hmm. right? It's interesting. You don't want to have a soup. You wouldn't want to have a super prominent rhythm section if you are having like a rhythm based vocalist. Yeah. But I've also seen a lot of like rappers or hip hop or pop artists use a drummer live and. Uh, one example I can think of is Elijah Woods and Jamie Fine. It's not a band that you would associate mm-hmm. with having an extraordinary drummer because mm-hmm. you wouldn't really think of them having a drummer at all. Yeah. But I saw them live, and their drummer is 
like full tilt crazy Mm -hmm. and i was talking with their with their uh their guitarist and he said yeah they actually had to tell him to like pull back when he first joined because he would be even more like balls to the walls the whole time and stole the show for me personally uh which was awesome and i've also seen i've seen watsky play with a real drummer um which was a lot of fun like and just like travis travis barker when he does collaborations with hip-hop artists like you can make it work, obviously. Like every single thing that I that I pretend to say as an absolute has exceptions yeah. because well, that's the beauty of music, right? It's so subjective and it's so diverse and you can do anything you want really. It's interesting because um speaking of hip hop and live drummers, uh I'm not sure if you've listened to him before, but Anderson Pack, um, this guy is talented as hell. And he'll play drums while he sings and raps. And then he'll step off the kit and then he'll use the track drum where he'll go crazy running around the stage. Then he'll come back for like a dancey song and he'll play the drums along while he's singing. And then, like I said, in rapping. And there are certain songs where he'll play where I'll be like, I couldn't imagine the drum track on that. I Like what you play on that acoustic set. Yeah, it's, you know, a little layered up with effects and things, but like it's it's an acoustic drum set that he's playing along and grooving with. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And kind of another group that, if I think of, like, that uses uh, acoustic rhythms almost, is Early Tribe. A lot of that kind of jazzy rhythm uh, drum sections uh, for their early hip-hop stuff, um, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. And I couldn't imagine it with the, the drum tracks. And then to your point, I couldn't imagine some hip-hop songs with an acoustic drum set it just wouldn't work it, it, it's just something that would you would never be able to do um pretty much all of kanye west stuff at, le- at least for the most part that i'm aware of but um yeah but then you know then there's people who might take kanye west song and put acoustic drums on it and you know you see these videos online where people do play alongs so yeah you know and that, that, that's the music of it. And that's what's fantastic because uh, I remember seeing Lauren Hill and she played, she had her drum track, but the drummer was playing over the drum track and maybe kind of similar situation what you were saying with the Elijah group is like, I was just zoned in on this drummer because he was just chopping away yeah. and everything like that. And, you know, it's a cool dynamic. And I think having that in a live setting, live drummer all the way. <laughs> Oh yeah, like uh, for me, there's been a lot of bands, like even Bleachers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're pop. Uh, Are they pop? The, the guitar player from Fun. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So he he leads that band, but when I saw them at Riot Fest, they had two drummers, and I hadn't really expected to even see one drummer kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that like that was really interesting. But honestly, even if the drummer isn't doing anything particularly interesting um i mean usually if a drummer's doing something a little bit more like held back they're going to be doing tricks or they're going to be showing a lot more personality Mm -hmm. like they're going to be having fun Mm -hmm. and for me if you've got a drummer on the stage i mean take this how take this how you will right but if you put a drummer on that stage that drummer is going to have my attention Mm -hmm. like your band will have my attention because I'm going to be looking at the drummer. If you wanted me to be looking somewhere else, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have to do something really cool, like a guitar solo or something to like pull me away. No. Cause most of the time I'm just like, I'm so focused on the drummer. And if you don't have that in your live band, then yeah, I feel like that's something Well, for, for me, who's always got my eye there. That's something that like that, it ends up lacking for me. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because um, I remember seeing Trivium and the guy's an insane drummer, but I instantly, this is kind of the opposite scenario of what happened with what you're saying is I couldn't take my eyes off the drummer, but it was for the wrong reason. He was doing all this technical stuff, but he had no emotion and no soul. It's honestly like he was standing in line at like a pickup line in the police station. Like he was just stone-faced like he was just he was going through the rhythms he wasn't enjoying himself he was just playing the parts and for me that that is hard to watch because you don't even have to have it you don't have to have a heavy montreal yeah 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 so um that was that was recently right yeah i remember 
Matt Casey saying that they were just coming off the end of an 11 month tour. Um, and like Matt Casey looks worse for wear too. Yeah. Uh, cause I found that before, like when I saw Weezer at Riot Fest, very honestly, um, they played music well, but boring performance. Like yeah. they didn't move a lot. They weren't doing, it didn't look like they were having a ton of fun. But then when I saw them at Rock Fest a couple of years later, it was their first day of tour, nice. and it they were they were amazing. Yeah. So that's one thing too. Like I find like sometimes I'm like you know what maybe maybe they're just having a bad day or it's been a really long tour. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is kind of it does kind of take away from it, which is like I saw Animals as leaders at Heavy Montreal, and that was I honestly like I walked away during the set just because. When the music's that technical, sometimes they don't have a lot of like emotion or like soul going on. Yeah. They're just kind of standing in place and like you can all, all three of them, like <laughs> the two guitarists and the drummer, are just kind of like they're focused on what they're doing and like they'll smile, but they don't really move. Yeah. So it, yeah, Matt, it's just kind of it's it's interesting because again, you don't have to be the most technical drummer, guitarist, bassist if you are feeling the music. You have my attention. You're putting on a good show. And that's the, it's funny you bring up Animals as Leaders because I've watched countless uh, live shows of theirs. And like Matt Garska, when he gets going at like, I think it's um, their, their closing song, he uh, like he gets into it. But other than that, he's he's just like, it's like, I, okay, technically this. And then Tosin, yeah, it's funny you say that he smiles because it's just like, yeah, they're there. And they're doing all this crazy technical stuff, and it goes it's like this. Super impressive. But... Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the fact that you're con- completely instrumental, and that technical. Yes, I will never say anything bad about them because they're amazing musicians. But the longevity of a live show and a tour isn't going to be there f- years down the road, in my opinion. Because you can look at even Dream Theater. They're technical as hell, man. But, you know, Mangini, he's, a, he's, he's crazy. But he still does his tricks and he interacts and, and stuff like that. So you lose the showmanship. It, it's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to keep going. But. but I do know some people who are like fan, who are like big prog nerds and stuff, right? Who just like just seeing them do it yeah is that's the that's the gratification that they get they're like oh it's literally playable like some people just want to just want them to prove that it can be done right yeah. they're just like i want to i want to see that you can actually do this because yeah. yeah some people like i know there's so many so many videos and posts and stuff about the guitars from rings of saturn people being like he can't play what he's actually doing like mm-hmm listen to this recording, it's bogus, or like whatever, and then he'll constantly have to come out with a video and be like, look, I will explain exactly what happened here. You were like, people, and he's just like, look, I will play it right now. I will give you proof that like, it's not sped up. I'm not doing things like in slow motion and then fast forwarding the recording yeah. or something like, yeah. because yeah, in some of those really technical genres, the whole appeal is just like faster, more technical, more possible, right? And that's one thing that's never really, yeah, that that really hasn't attracted me about music. Like, I'm more into good songwriting versus, uh, not that I don't appreciate extreme technicality yeah. or that there aren't bands that I enjoy because they do things that I don't understand, um, but some bands or some genres where kind of the ethos just feels like bigger, better, um like more technical more speed more volume um which is kind of like yeah a lot of i think like specifically like thrash metal or speed metal that i've never really gotten into just because there's just something about you know i like yeah. i know some people I, talk <laughs> about like cave, like caveman riffs in like yeah. a good way but like yeah, yeah it just <laughs> It just doesn't appeal to me as much, like kind of the the sort of macho masculine attitude of, of some metal music, you know. It's interesting because one thing that I'm finding, and people might not agree with this, or they might even be like, "Oh, you're just a hater because you know you don't play that genre." I find that 
I love Prague. I'll just say that right right off the bat. I love Prague. I love the, the musicians, like the contortionists. I love, you know, uh, Tesseract. I love them all. I think they have soul, a lot of these ones, and they're super technical. The thing is, though, is that unfortunately what's happening is now bands and artists are now cre- – Pr- Prague is creating an environment of competition where it's like – not about coming out with something super soulful or fun to play and, you know, jam along to. It's like, oh, I went this time signature three different freaking times in like a 10 second period. And like, you know, it becomes this this competition. And unfortunately, sometimes, and I'm not saying not all endorsers, but the, the not the smart ones go for things that are like, oh, well, this guy you know, I'm giving, we're going to give him a double bass pedal because he's literally the fastest. Well, you should also look at the guys who literally influenced that band. And it, it, one of my favorite uh, drummers, Ray Luzier, he of Korn, um, he did an interview and he said, he's like, I'm not in a prog band. He's like, you want me to play prog? I'll play prog. Fine. But this is like, I play to the song. And that's why Korn has, song. has smash smashers, man. They have countless singles. Because, yeah, he's technical and he plays to what the song is. Where a lot of times, and I'm going to use Prague again, is, is that it's like you're literally, you're, you're open strumming, with creating this just atmospheric sound, and then you're just technically layering all these different, you know, beats and rhythms over it. And it's like a competition for other drummers. And again, kind of what Ray said one time, he's like, I'm not playing for the the one drummer in the room. I'm playing for the thousand people that are watching, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, and you're much better to underplay than overplay, I think. Yeah. Like, and even you look at some of the most iconic riffs or uh, songs, and, like, you look at drum beats. I mean, even some of the, like, the biggest touring bands, um or even drummers who have made like Rolling Stones top 100 list. Like sure. the drummer from ACDC had I'll have, like never been a fan of ACDC, but I will admit like the drum fills are pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. But 90% of what he's doing is the same two basic like 4/4 four, yep. four beats. Yep. And like but then there's something also to be said about like you're a drummer who can keep solid time and serve the yep. song. So that's it's all you really need and it works like yeah it's like, it's, yeah. like white from the white strikes isn't a particularly talented drummer mm-hmm. um gets a lot of hate actually yeah but in the context of the white stripes it that's worked, what it is right? so yeah and it's it's interesting because there's so many times and again where people are like you want to talk about influential drummers one thing that I always think about, at least when I write, it's like, I want to write something that's technical, it's fun to play, and I hope that some kid goes, you know what, I'm going to practice that, and I'm going to play it along to a song. And, you know, uh, Shane Donovan of uh, uh, System of Down, how many people practice Chop Suey? That's like one of the most influential, you know, drum beats to, you know, a, a generation. A lot of kids. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's just like, he's not going out and doing blast beats every single night, but he's writing something that influenced, you know, a generation of drummers. And Chad Smith, you know, he's amazing. He's yeah. got funk. He's got impeccable timing. And you can even look at, you know, guitarists. You want to talk about ACDC? I don't like ACDC, but their riffs, their riffs... Are, are something that literally has sparked so many bands after them that we wouldn't even have them Catching having iconic, that iconic, right? Yeah. 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 Or I think about, too, like, uh, like Ringo Starr. Yeah. You know, like, but I watched a video with, like, I can't remember all the people they interviewed, but there was definitely Chad Smith, mm-hmm. Dave Grohl, and some others all just talking about how much of an influence Ringo Starr was on them and how iconic his style was and how, like, how... Ahead of his time. <laughs> just, there, there, there wouldn't be the kind of drumming we have without, without 
without him. But I mean, there wouldn't be a lot of the music that we have today without yeah. uh, a lot of innovation that the Beatles brought forward. So, yeah, and it's just it's not and like I've said it before. It's like it's not always about technicality. It's not always about speed. It's literally just about going up and making something that people are going to enjoy. And, you know, that that's that's the type of music that lives on. I mean, you can write for whatever reason you want. You're writing music, it, it's art, and at least you're writing music. But I guess my kind of two cents is, like, don't make it a sense where you feel like you have to be the best. Because you'll never be the best. I, I've... I, I'll never be the best drummer because there is no best drummer. There is no best guitarist. It's subjective. Exactly. So just people just need to just go out and just play music. <laughs> you know. Like just do something that you have fun doing, that you yeah. enjoy doing, and then hopefully other people will also enjoy it mm -hmm. and possibly have fun, like mm -hmm. maybe even learning it yeah. as well. Because I know some drummers who are like, yeah, I'm going to – or some like musicians of, of any kind who are yeah. just like, I'm going to do something that is impossible to replicate or drummers. And like, I can think of like Gary and Terrence marathon who is sometimes I've heard him like curse certain drummers for making things impossible to play. Cause it's like, cause you end up enjoying it so much that you want to be able to, to replicate it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I gave up a long time ago on the notion of like being a superb, you know, musician on any instrument kind of thing. Yeah. As long as I can do what I want to mm -hmm. and play things that I like, great. And if I can't, then I'll, like, if there's something like, oh, I wish I could do that, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn it and mm -hmm. that'll make me better. Um, but it's not a pursuit of, like, being better than anyone else other than better than I was the day before. Right. Kind of thing. 100%. And I think more people need to kind of do that and and look at it in that sense because uh, you know it's uh, it's just going to create a division and you know especially even in local music scenes. Um, I've seen it does, yeah. I, I've seen so many bands where um, they weren't technical, but they went up and they just they just killed it. They were just so into their music, and yeah. I respected it more than the band that came up after. And was just like, even in the warm up, just like, and I was like, okay, <laughs> like, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and it's exactly. just like, play, it, play, it, play, play something, play something that I'm gonna enjoy, uh, and and you'll have my attention, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I'll definitely be impressed. And yeah. like, there are drummers that I have seen do that. Like, I've mm -hmm. seen about like, like Monteith. Oh, like love that's it. a drummer that yeah. like you know what super technical super fast but what he's doing is also a lot of fun yeah exactly and it's it's like it's also there's like intent behind mm -hmm. it right it's like yeah. intentionally over the top that's what that whole band is to me is just like the mm -hmm. most high octane rock and roll that I've ever seen in my life yeah and every member serves that in the way that they're playing their instrument. They are they are literally like the I'm gonna say the two thousand four uh Lakers. Like literally, you know, you know, you had everybody had a rose like Rick Fox, he wasn't the greatest basketball player of all time. Derek Fisher wasn't the greatest basketball player of all time. But these guys are some of the best in the world. I find Monteith know every single person's role and they play off of it. And they respect each other's roles. And honestly, I've never seen, you know, I remember seeing them the first time and then seeing them the second time. Literally, they pushed each other more. That, they, that's a band that progressively they just try and take it to the next level. Like when you see them uh, one day and then you see them in a, in a month, it could be, it might be playing the same music, but it's going to be a different show. It's not, uh, I, you know. I've, uh, on, on tour, TRX Marathon has stayed at their place in New Brunswick. Nice. Um, we last tour we were there for two nights. They were they were nice enough nice enough to let us stay and, and hang out, and we played a show in their basement and stuff. Yep. And uh, they did a Def Leppard cover set that was simply like it was amazing. They did it with a couple of the Monteith guys and a couple of roommates. I think uh, the drummer wasn't there at the time. 
Um, so they just they just like slap something together. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun, and they are some of the nicest people to hang out with. Yeah. And some of just like the nicest people, like genuinely kindest people I've ever met. So yeah. It's it's funny. Yeah. I remember dear, dear friends. It was. Uh, this was about oh my goodness, it's probably about two months ago. I had sent out a, a request. Uh, I was just saying, you know, somebody play along to a song or whatever it was. And uh, they got back to me and I asked them to do, I don't know if you watched the video yet. If people haven't watched the video, go and watch them cover Ace of Spades by Motorhead. They just like put the shit together and they did it in their living room. And it, it was, it was killer. Like it was, it was killer. Yeah. Anyway, well, it just goes to show that there's literally so much good music in Canada. There's so much good music oh, yeah. everywhere. And, and like, we just got to support the hell out of it when we get out of this uh this whole situation yeah yeah i hope i hope that everyone kind of i mean i know people are, are like anxious to get back to shows yeah. but i hope that it goes beyond just like an initial wave of like yeah of cabin fever yeah. with relief and that that people continue to invest in and support their uh their local music community their local scene and like the industry as a whole uh because it's definitely gonna need gonna need the the help when it when it gets back on its feet yeah all right alex well i think we're gonna call it a quits um this, this is uh it was excellent talking to you um i hope that once we get uh out of this we just do some crazy show or whatever but um it was good catching up and i wish you uh, and your bandmates all the best and we'll talk again soon yeah i know it, it was awesome uh talking with you and uh, hopefully we'll be able to grab a beer once this is all done <laughs> like four beer <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right later man take all care right. Bye. See, you, man. see ya